Welcome back to the Dino Bidala Show. We're live here Friday, March 15th, third hour Friday can only mean one thing on this show. What just happened? As we look back at the insanity of the week, and we're joined by three people, two returning champions, and a new person who has the most unique background of anyone that's been on the show. Jessica Brodkin, comedian, Reiki healer, and former CIA officer, as in the Central Intelligence Agency. Jessica, welcome on board. And just was done before the show, you actually started comedy when you worked at the CIA, which, which must have been interesting. Yes, I did. Um, and uh, I roasted my managers during the all hands meetings. I stopped getting promoted as a result. And my managers also showed up to my shows without any announcement. So I would get off stage and then see my managers at the end of the, you know, at the end back of the room. Are you suggesting the CIA was monitoring your communications? So that they show by the show. <laughs> you, is that what you're getting at? Because I think we got that. We all know that. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. That's so funny. At the CIA, and Lisbon says back, at the CIA, if you make fun of the managers, you don't move up. But if you waterboard people, big time promotions. <laughs> Lisbon says here, comedian, co-creator of Common Central, The Daily Show, activist, creator of Abortion Access Front, and host of the podcast, Feminist Buzz Kids Live. Liz, how are you? Nice to see you. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm great. I'm great. I mean, I'm not great. Whatever. I'm here. Right. I'm existing in a sea of garbage like Perfect. everyone else. Well, mm -hmm. thank you for summing up the show. And yeah, by just want to do it. We're going to talk about Minnesota in a second, but let me introduce our third comic who's been on many times before, Brian Wall, a stand-up comic. He appeared in the sold-out off-Broadway musical, The Wizard of Friendship, which is now touring all over, including Canada. And he's co-host of a podcast, My Favorite Friendship Podcast. Brian, good to see you. Oh, so great to be back. And yeah, the world is on fire, but I'm still listening to those Little John Meditation CDs, and it's really nice. <laughs> By the way, Brian was on last time, like a month ago. Little John, this is no joke, released Meditation CDs. Stop it. Stop and I thought you were kidding. But with Brian, <laughs> So Brian, tell what happened. You tagged it, and then Little John responded. Yes, Little John was, was really excited about it. He <laughs> DM'd me and said, thanks for talking about it. What a, <laughs> what a sweet guy. He Brian mentioned it on the show and put the clip up and tagged Little John. Little John respond online. So now we're gonna we got to book Little John. So see what you can do. We'll see what we do. All right, let's talk about something that happened <laughs> in both the neck of the woods where Liz is a tireless activist and literally where she's from. On Thursday, Vice President Kamala Harris visited Planned Parenthood in St. Paul, Minnesota, and it's the first time a vice president or a president ever visited a a Planned Parenthood or a place that provides abortion. So Liz. You're so, you're an activist. This is the first time this has ever happened. You've been an activist before Roe v. Wade was overturned. What do you, what's your reaction to this? I mean, I think it's really great. I'm actually in Minnesota right now. I live here part of the time. Um, I I I think it's um, historic that the vice president came to a facility that provides abortions. Um, I'm really happy about that. Um, but I got to be honest. Um, as somebody who is on the board of an independent abortion provider in Minnesota and somebody who's had abortions, um, the way that they're framing abortion um, really makes people who provide the care and people who've had abortions feel like they're being judged every moment that they don't say the word abortion. It really, and I don't say that hyperbolically, I'm not trying to be an asshole. It's just really true. And what's happening right now is they're not legislating a reproductive freedom or a pro-choice, they're legislating abortion. And for those of us who've had them to save our lives, to move forward, um, it would be really nice to hear them say the word and not caveat around it so that we feel like they actually know how to advocate because it's it's really important for those who are working in the field and those mm -hmm. who've had abortions. Yesterday, I played a clip of my show, Vice President Harris speaking, and she mentioned the services Planned Parenthood provides. She did mention abortion at the end. I thought of you. I know we've had this conversation. It, it was the last thing, and that, and the fact that Planned Parenthood provide, I think provides three percent of its services are abortion. But also, here's the deal: I gotta stop. This is why I go wild because listing all of this stuff that Planned Parenthood provides acts like, and we have to do abortions. Okay. Many the independent providers in this country that provide a, almost abortion exclusively do so because the need for abortion is so great that they can't provide other services. And so couching it in, they do all this other stuff and only 3% of, of what we do. And so let's not focus on that is really damaging to 
talking about abortion. It keeps it in a shame space. It keeps it in a space of judgment. It keeps it in a, we have to do this dirty thing that the whores have. And it doesn't really center it around a moral choice that people make in their reproductive lifetime. One in four women will have an abortion. Um, and I and I just feel like we need to start reinventing the way we talk about it so that we can not act like it's the dirty stepchild that we have to tolerate. Jessica, you know, what's your view that now for the first time in over 50 years, women have lost a fundamental right to control their own destiny. And you have these Republicans in 14 states now have banned abortion at conception and they're openly imposing their religion as law. And people are like, well, that's the consequences of election. I'm like, they're imposing their religion as law and forcing women against their will to carry a fetus to term. This, how is this America? But this is where we are. So what's your take on this? Um, I mean, we have a couple of issues. Obviously, we have um, religious fundamentalism and we don't have the separation of church and state, which is how our country was founded. So that's a serious problem. And then the other thing is also women's health issue. So um, like aside from um, agency over our bodies, but it's also like people have miscarriages. They can go into sepsis in Texas or in, in other states. So it's it's really, really problematic from a just a, even just basic health. And then the IVF is under fire as well. So um, that's a whole nother ball of wax that is related and very bizarre. Um, and we have just these factions in America that are just trying to control women and also just impose their religion on everyone. Uh, Not good. Not good. Like, if look, if you want to play the let's impose religion on everyone, you know, I'm Muslim. There's a lot of stuff we can do. You know, <laughs> it'll be turkey bacon for everyone. And just kidding, you're Jewish. I mean, like if we yeah. started imposing our religion, it's only the Christian right that gets to impose yes. their religion. Yes. The rest of us who are minority faiths, and Brian's a minority faith too, he's Jewish as well, that the rest of us Jews and Muslims, if we dare do this, we're gone. Bye-bye. So it's, Brian, should we join forces and try to impose some kind of Jewish... No. Islamic law or just keep the separation of church, mosque, temple, and state? You know, we traditionally had a little bit of trouble agreeing on things, Jews and Muslims. <laughs> so maybe maybe it would be best <laughs> to leave that out of it. Well, maybe I we mean, can agree on this one. We don't want your religion as our law. How about that? I mean, I kind of simple yeah. one. I mean, I, I'm amazed. Planned Parenthood has existed for over 100 years. And how, how do we as as a country not Look at this organization that has been functioning for over a hundred years for some cues. Like maybe they know some things. Maybe we could talk to them and hear how they message things and what they are focusing on. It, you know, I I believe in copying off the smart kid in class. I think it's a great idea, and it would be a really nice thing if the administration would talk to people from Planned Parenthood to come up with a unified message. Well, Planned Parenthood isn't the only abortion provider. That's like saying we should talk to Whole Foods about everything and Whole Foods knows best. That's not how it works. I want to Trader Joe's. No, honestly, talk like, I, like I just have to push back because yeah. Planned Parenthood is, we talk about Planned Parenthood as though they invented this, that they are the only way that people do things. Um, people need to understand that it is the independent community providers in this country that provide the lion's share of abortion care. They also are now dealing with um, uh, situations where they're, because people are, because of the bans, people are pushed to have abortions later in pregnancy. Planned Parenthood doesn't do 90% of those abortions. It's the independent wow. clinics that do. And when you have a, like the, I serve on the board of whole women's health, which has seven clinics around the country. They were argued to the Supreme court alone without any big major people who provide reproductive care, helping them. Um, they had to close clinics in Texas and then remained open in Haven states like Minnesota. So when you talk about who we want the administration to talk to, I would say, sure, talk to Planned Parenthood. But that's like, um, it's just to me, talking to a chain is not the same as talking to the people who are doing it. Every abortion experience is different. And if somebody's not providing the wide range of abortion care, you should be talking to the people that provide the sweeping range of abortion and reproductive care. That's all. I didn't mean yeah. to attack you, but I just yeah. feel like Planned Parenthood yeah, is not synonymous with that, Brian. The, <laughs> all of it. That's it. I think he, I, I'm so glad that Liz is telling me this because my only experience has been working with Planned Parenthood with my partner and I. So, uh, yeah, 
I mean, please. Yeah, Educate no, no, no. More. Yeah, it's just like, and and as somebody who's started an organization to uplift these independent providers, I, because I'm the same way, Brian. I started out solely servicing and supporting Planned Parenthood because they're the people who you sure. see and know, right? But when you find out, like all the expansive way that this movement can be um, needs to be talked to. Uh, you really realize that it's only there's like one sliver of of giving advice. And also, truth be told, when you provide care, like talk to people about care who provide care, but like also messaging, they can't really do the fuck you messaging that activists can do, right? Activists mm-hmm. can bring hit the gut. And so I one of the reasons that we started abortion access part was to say people who provide the care should provide the care. They should inform us, but we should also speak to the id of what's happening so that we can say, you people are garbage and they can just continue to provide the care. And then we can really rise up, raise up what's happening. Right. We all have a job to do. That's That's all I'm saying. It's well put. And actors play a different role for each different activity. Uh, And and they play a role that other like respectable politics type of thing, the respectability politics people can't. But I'm trying to Chester Brodkin. Liz Winstead and Brian Wall. So the governor of Minnesota, the state you're in right now, Tim Walz, said he called on, quote, old white men to start listening to women on abortion after Vice President Harris went to the Planned Parenthood clinic. Do you think, Jessica, you think that's the end of it? Old white men are going to start listening to women now because the governor of Minnesota said it that way? Are we done with old white men telling women what to do? Um, do I think they're going to start listening? You know, I think one of the major issues that we just have as a country and maybe just as a society is that we don't listen to each other. Hmm. Um, and that, and I don't even know how to break through. And the other thing that I think is related, uh, is that we are also very tribal just as humans. So not a lot of people are willing to like bridge the gap and actually listen with open ears. They just really want information that confirms whatever they already believe. And then with a the polarization of uh, that social media has created even more so, people are just listening, stuck in these echo chambers that fulfill their algorithm. And so I think that if we can all, that's why I really enjoy diversity of thought in general mm-hmm. um, across the board in academia and in, ev- in politics and everything. I really, I, I really just believe that people should listen to each other, but I don't even know how we can go from here to there. Like, that's a question. Well- I, it's an interesting point. I mean, my show really is, um, it's really called the Echo Chamber, by the way. I'm sure not sure that's my subtitle for the show. It's all progressive <laughs> echo all the time. And if you want, I even tell conservatives, they want to call my show. They do call the show. And I go, there are so many conservative shows. We've got so few progressives. Yeah. Let us just have, I'm not going to take your calls. I go, don't take it personally. And I'm like, do you really think you're going to call up in one minute? Some liberals like, you know what? That Trump actually makes sense. I never heard it that yeah, way before. Yeah. Of course not. You're out of your mind. And so there's there's a fine line between it being an echo chamber and yeah. not wasting my time with stupidity. Yeah. And sure. I hate to be the arrogant liberal when I I'm not I'm not pushing back on you. Although this show you can. it's funny, we I had mean, Mason Zion okay. a couple weeks ago. I think the subtitle for the show should, should really be um I don't want to push back, but because that's <laughs> That's what it is. Oh, I don't want to push back, but this happens like ninety times a show. So, just, how do we ahead, get? The, how do we get? How do we get these people to listen? How do we Which get people? people? Which or, people? Or how do you get people who are like conservative and who are anti-abortion to actually listen? Like, how religious do we? Fundamentalists? Actually... Have you talked to them? Fundam- no, I'm not I don't kidding. think that's going to happen. Had a conversation with religious. <laughs> Liz, you've you've dealt with them. Yeah. Are they reasonable? Are they just waiting to see the other side? The religious no. fundamentalists. No, and the thing is. Um, once they have decided that your value system has reduced you to uh, less than than human, because that's what's happened. Mm-hmm. Like when I deal with the anti-abortion extremists, um, they literally have said to me, you are a tool of the devil for supporting this. Therefore, I am blessed by God to harm you. Like that is, mm-hmm. and that's, and that's not even, mm-hmm. um, that's not even like a fringe group. That is people who are holding office in uh, in state houses around the country. That is uh, wide swaths, Operation Rescue, Operation Save America, March for Life. So they have set up a, a value system that allows them to be sanctioned by their God to harm us. I mean, they have literally follow a playbook that's called um, 
the doctrine of lesser magistrates, which actually says you should defy the laws of man if they go against the laws of God. And that is a practiced doctrine that hundreds of thousands of these people follow. Right. Brian? So I always, Are yeah, so done? whatever, done. <laughs> so, so Brian, this week, uh, the singer Olivia Rodrigo, who's very popular with the young people, they, they really like her a lot, gave out free emergency contraception available to concert goers at her tour and also made a donation to organizations, this case in Missouri, which is banned abortion at conception with no exceptions whatsoever. Um, how important do you think it is? Like you've got young people, it's grassroots activism. You know, you have formal activism, you have Liz Abortion Access Front or other people out there doing their thing. And now you have a singer who's like, I'm going to wake up young people who are in their 20s and even younger about the threat that's going on. So, Brian, what do you think? Well, I think it's fantastic. I, I think, uh, you know, Olivia Rodrigo, I'm not even sure if she's 21 yet and she she's doing this. It's fantastic. I, I, I think it, it, it shows that there's there are people that are open to having a conversation that go to Olivia Rodrigo concerts. And and that's where that conversation can be had. You know, when, when as an artist, you can control what's going on in your space from the second the customer walks through the door. And if that's what she wants to do, I think that's wonderful. I think it is too. It would have been creepy if I knew her exact age, I think. Yeah, you know, I, know. I was just, waiting for that. She I just turned about... 21 on, on June 9th. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm like, what a weirdo. Sorry. <laughs> At least I don't it know wasn't 18, she's you know? I just know she's young. That's all I know. But but I think it's great. And where's Taylor Swift? I say that because Aaron, who works on my show, loves Taylor Swift. Why isn't Taylor Swift handing out emergency contraception? So we're continuing our conversation. Jessica Broadkin, Liz Wanstead, and Brian Wall. So, okay, let's talk about Wait, Let's can look. I just say, I just, course, can I just Liz. weigh in on this? Of course, Liz. Okay, because A, Olivia Rodrigo didn't pass out emergency contraception at her shows. The local organizations who were oh. there are the people passing it out. And as of today, Olivia Rodrigo has banned that from happening because she got blowback saying what? that it's, yes. I was reading the CNN article. It says that, I'll read right from it. She made free emergency contraception available to Yeah, contraception. all of the press has got it wrong. She did not make really? anything available. I she made she this. made space oh. for organizations okay. to, to pass it out themselves. And my and I, I was quoted in The Guardian on this, and I'm really excited because along after Olivia Rodrigo leaves, people have emergency contraception, condoms, and information from the local organizations written on their thing so they know who to go to, right? Mm. But Olivia Rodrigo, it's just in Jezebel, came out about two hours ago, um, has stopped allowing that to happen because she got blowback and her her team issued a statement saying, oh, we're, we're afraid that it's going to get into the hands of younger people because Missouri politicians put out this massive statement equating emergency contraception with abortion pills. They are not the same. Emergency contraception stops pregnancy from happening. Abortion pills terminate a pregnancy. And so apparently her camp bought into the rhetoric and wow. and cowed down. So now going forward, organizations aren't allowed to pass it out there anymore. So I just want to give that context uh, for everybody. Uh, I was so excited about it. And then yeah. when I heard that, I was like, womp, womp. And she was going to donate a portion of the proceeds from her St. Louis concert to benefit the organization, the abort. Missouri Abortion Fund. She's still doing that. Oh, that's still, still happening. That. So that's she's still okay, donating that's to the funds, right. but pressure and lies from the anti-abortion movement just making up bullshit. Um, their camp said no more doing that. Jessica, would you get in like this if you were having a comedy tour, Jessica Brodkin, and there was something you were passionate about, and then you were getting a, a pushback like this publicly? Would I give in? Would you give in to the right-wing elected no, officials? Absolutely well, you know what? Not. I don't want to lose care. any. No, of course not. Ever, someone's going to hate you no matter what. So you might as well stand up for whatever you believe. And you might as well like help whenever you can. I think one of the difficult parts uh, of being human and like caring about stuff that's going on is that there's so many things on fire at the same time. Uh -huh. And so it's kind of like pick something where you can have an impact and then and then do that. So no, I wouldn't give. Yeah. I, I, I Also, in during my... um. This is this was 150 years ago, but when I was in college, I was um, I was the person in charge of hang, of handing out um, prophylactics in school. So I used to be the sex ed person at MIT. <laughs> at, at MIT, you were in STEM, as I know from your comedy. Yes, as it was in STEM. Yes, Brian, what's the name of your dog? Brian's dog just showed up a minute ago. Now is oh, 
His name is uh, Blue, like in Blue's Clues. Aww. Really? That's very nice. Yeah. Adorable dog. It's very... <laughs> Although Messi, the dog from Anatomy of a Fall, is like the greatest acting dog I've ever seen in my life. Aww. I don't want to get into it. But that dog, excellent <laughs> actor. And if you haven't seen Anatomy of the Fall, you have to check it out. So, all right, what can we see here? This is kind of fun because that's to do with someone in Minnesota. And again, I know that Liz knows this person, Congressman Ilhan Omar. Uh, Re Republican strategist and CNN analyst Scott Jennings, who's an asshole, on air called Congressman Omar this week, quote, a public relations agent for Hamas sitting in the U.S. Congress. Now, Congressman Omar, who I know as well, has denounced the October 7th terrorist attack, of course. She's only spoken about Palestinian humanity. That's the only thing she's talked about. But this guy on air, and there's no pushback from CNN at all to this, a public relations agent for Hamas sitting in Congress. Liz, you've dealt with people who try to silence you by describing you in all sorts of ways. Is this just another right-wing effort to silence someone that because Scott Jennings, that jackass, doesn't like what she's saying? I mean, this is really dangerous, saying she's involved with terrorism. It's really unbelievable. And Ilhan not only is, she's my congressperson here in Minnesota, and she's also my dear friend. And this happens to her constantly. But this is where we have come when, you know, Jessica, going back to your point, which is so spot on, we don't talk to each other, we don't listen. And anybody who tries to center the humanity of someone is called a Hamas terrorist. We uh, at Abortion Access Front, started a menstrual program for the folks in Gaza because people can't get menstrual products. There's no place for them to get them. So we started a fun drive to get menstrual products to the people of Gaza. And all I got on my Instagram feed was, we're supporting Hamas, Hamas, blah, 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 blah. And so it's unless we actually sit down and listen and understand humanity, I just feel like we're screwed. It's... It's on. It's part of the situation. And I know people are emotional about things, but Scott Jennings, he said it a few days ago, this is not like some high emotion time. This is a guy scoring political points and demonizing Muslims. I can speak to this. Uh, yes, is it of one of the go to's Republicans for many, many years before Trump called for a ban of Muslims? Other Republican elected officials said Islam is a cancer and it's evil and should be cut out of the country. And so I'm not I've been called a mouthpiece for terrorism so many times over the years. It's kind of died down now because they have other people like Congressman Omar. But in her case, she gets death threats. Like, this isn't a game. Like, it, it's dangerous death threats where she's got to get security. Unbelievable. All right. So, Jessica, any reaction there? You've seen a lot. CIA? Have um, you, seen, you know, Islam Islam CIA? Islamophobia is... Uh, it's, a, it's one of the cancers of America. Do you know what I mean? Like, I, I really... I mean, I, um, also as a Jewish person, I feel like Islamophobia and anti-Semitism are just like two sides of d the same coin in terms of from the religious right, in terms of being a religious minority. Um, so when I talk to my Muslim friends about Islam, um, either Islamophobia or, or anti-Semitism, I feel like Muslims really get anti-Semitism better than um, they understand it way better than the Christians do in America. So I think we we just have to work together to to fight this i don't yeah, know how it much. tends to be the people in general who hate jews hate muslims and vice versa absolutely it's, it's rare, the same it's people. rare yeah it's it's look there are some exceptions but it's rare you're gonna have someone who's like really hates jews but you know i really love those muslims you know those are good people and gay people and that kind of stuff yeah yeah, yeah they tend to hate everything that's not them that's a big part of it so all right, let's take a quick break, my friends, and come back. We have a lot to cover, including TikTok going away, Elon Musk, the defender of free speech, canceling Don Lemon, and, and a lot more. Beyonce going country, and I know people are talking about it. I just want to understand it, if someone can help me. So let's take a break, come back with more of the Dino Bidala show and what just happened right after this. Ready? Come right back. And welcome back, Dino Bidala show. It's still Friday, March 15th, and still staying with us, Jessica Brodkin, Liz Winstead, and Brian Wall. All right, so... Let's talk one more thing of politics. Joe Biden, a week ago Thursday, gave a very well-received, objectively speaking, State of the Union. Even Fox News anchors either said it was good or said he was on drugs because it was so good. They're like, <laughs> he had to be on cocaine because it was that good. So implicitly, they were all admitting it was good. Yet not really any movement in over a week in approval ratings or in head-to-head -head with Donald Trump. A whole bunch of polls came out the last couple of days taken post-State of the Union. And it's all margin of error. I mean, Trump and Biden are tied within the margin of error. And I know polls don't mean that much. But I thought there'd be a little bit of a bump, something. 
Ryan, what do you make it? You think people are, I'm not going to answer for it. What, what do you think is going on? I think they, they had the unfortunate case of everything going a little too smoothly. If something went a little bit wrong, then there would have been more attention on it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think that's really the main problem. I mean, you look at uh, Saturday Night Live, they focused on uh, the Republican response Katie Britt. for the most part. Yeah. Uh, and and they got Scarlett Johansson to play Katie Britt. So I, I think that was the big takeaway was that uh, Katie Britt and the Republicans are too, so wackadoo. And so people ignored how much Joe Biden went at the Supreme Court, how, how uh, direct his language was and how, how great his speech was. But it, it just went so well that it went over everyone's head. People seem to like it. It just I don't know what doesn't move people. What I liked about the speeches, what you were saying, he went, look, he talked about the threat to democracy and made it clear some people in that room who are looking at him are the threat. It wasn't FDR talking about the Nazis in Germany. He's like, and some people here I have defended the January 6th terrorists. My favorite part of Save the Union is when he slowed it down and sort of did that Backstreet Boys thing where he leans in and is like, girl, just want you to know, I love you, America. That kind of stuff. And then he backed back up. But he really did. Like he slowed it down and leaned in on the, the podium. Just want to say, you are my fire, my one desire, that kind of stuff. So Liz, is politics so broken that people are going to make up their mind the last week or the polls mean nothing? What's your take on all of this? I think my take is, you know, from a communication standpoint, I think that Biden was so determined to not be like sleepy Joe uh, missing a beat that he just came in at 95 and started yelling through the whole thing. (laughs) I mean, like I, I, I can see. Can't you all see that meeting? Can't you all you got to go in with your energy up, keep your energy up, blah, 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 you know. You know that that's what happened. And so that was interpreted as I'm going to just be sound mad and being mad is righteous. I like mad, but there's a nuance to how you do the mad. And, you know, it's kind of like and I just think it what it did, it did confuse, you know, the permanent professional haters. It's like, you know, is he unenergetic and slipping or is he the ball of fire you know, criminal mastermind behind all things that are terrible because really both can't be true. Um, so, you know, I don't know who it, in the end of the day, uh, I don't know who it was for. It almost felt like they didn't strategize around who Biden needed to speak to because he didn't need to speak to died in the wool Democrats. He needed to speak to disenfranchised young people who view what's happening in the Middle East, who view student loans, who view a lot of things very differently than mainstream Democrats do. And I just feel like this it, it just didn't speak to hmm. those people. It's interesting your take on it. Like it really, it was like a get off my lawn speech, except it was <laughs> substance. Like yeah. you're going to get off my oh, lawn. Yeah. It's like protect reproductive freedom. We're going to raise taxes on the rich and get off my lawn at the same time. Like that kind of older guy. Itching. So Jessica, what, what was your take? And, and do you think the polls are, are just locked in to the end and this election be decided by a handful of people or are people not paying attention yet? What do you think's going on? You know, I think that the young, I think a lot of young people are not watching it. So if, if it was on TikTok. You know, ironically, then maybe maybe Gen Z would have paid attention and it would have changed the polls. So maybe TikTok could be could have been our savior. But um, I'm not. Yeah. I uh, Generally, it's just like a few people at the end who I think are going to like swing it one way or, or, or the other. I think a lot of people are not. I, I would agree with Brian that I think a lot of people are not really uh, paying attention unless something crazy happens. But it was a great speech. It, I think it's objectively- amazing. It, it delivered. Liz makes a good point, though. Who was the speech for? I think part of it was honestly to placate Democrats who are really concerned about him. And like, yeah. you're like, oh my God, maybe because you see so much coverage, you're like, okay, maybe he is too old. Maybe he is a doddering old gentleman. And he gets up there and you're like, oh, he's good. He raised yeah. $10 million in one day. And I hate big money in politics, but it is a metric in that it was the most money raised in the entire campaign in 24 hours, $20, $10 million. So it did, I think, in that regard. But Look, I mean, he's out on the road. He's getting a lot of local press, which is important. He was just in swing states in Michigan and Wisconsin this week. That's important. It's, you know, and you mentioned TikTok. 
it's I so Jessica, let me ask you used to work, you left the CIA a long time ago. I did. I really wish do you have ago. contacts in the CIA? Can you ask them like is TikTok, is China really giving the data of um, TikTok to the Chinese government because ByteDance owns it and it's connected to the Chinese I, government? I can't I can't say anything and I don't confirm know. or deny. I can't confirm or deny anything. I, I do know that one of my former colleagues does post on Twitter or an X uh about it that the but I'm I'm not sure. So I yeah I can't I can't say security things unfortunately. No, I understand. Brian, are you on TikTok? I am, but not nearly as much as my wife is. She's on <laughs> it like constantly. I do you have it. an account? Do you post stuff? I do. Yeah, not not a whole lot. Mostly like stand up clips or, or clips from uh, shows I do. But are you big in yeah. China now? As a result, <laughs> <laughs> man, you, I wish that that'd be great. I'd love to go visit there, see what it's like for myself. So what do you what what do you make of the idea of like if, if this it passed the House three hundred and fifty two votes to sixty five, one of the rare things they almost all agree on. In the Senate it's gonna have a little tough time there, but it would require ByteDance to sell their interest in it, no ties to China, or they're gonna it won't be on the apps anymore. It's not like they're gonna take it away from us if you already have it, which is kind of weird. So 170 million, that's okay, but it won't be able to be downloaded unless they pass new legislation going, and we're coming to your phone, give us your phone and delete and then hand it back to you. Brian, what do you make of the idea of, of banning TikTok? I mean, ultimately that's what they want to do or they want to change the way it's run by giving it to an American company that won't allow the things that people are seeing on TikTok that obviously bothers people, whatever it might be. I think it's incredibly frustrating and it's hard to take them seriously. The, the fact that Congress was able to come together uh, about banning TikTok, but they can't come together about anything else is absolutely infuriating. Uh, how is this the priority instead of gun violence, instead of reproductive rights, instead of taxation, instead of all sorts of things that we have going wrong, the environment, all sorts of things. But TikTok, TikTok is the thing that they can come across the aisle and agree on. It's absolutely infuriating. And any representative that voted yes to banning TikTok, any millennial that sees that, we're going to say, oh, I can't take you seriously whatsoever. Interesting. That's very, look, I have 172 followers on TikTok. They're not going to get my account from me. Like I have no, and I only want my data to be harvested by Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. I mean, how dare China get involved in all this? Liz, do you guys use TikTok for abortion access front or your own work? Yeah, we have. It's been really interesting, too, because we have a really robust TikTok account. Like we get oh. hundreds and hundreds of thousands of views wow. um, on our videos. And over the past two weeks, a video, we've gotten 49 views, oh. 60 views. It has been really um kind of astounding to watch the trajectory change like profoundly and and one of our videos we even had under the desk news who I they know. have like three million followers they yeah. shared one of our videos and the numbers didn't go up at all so i don't know if it's um you know a plot to try to get people like us mad you know to push like to save tiktok but um it does sure seem like not only are they pretending like they're mad about China. They just want Steve Mnuchin or some rich MAGA person to be able to be the American that buys the company so that we're all now Twitter's gone and then TikTok will be gone for us as well. And I really, that's my biggest concern because um, I'm more concerned about people in general in America who want to find me and get my information than I am about China. The, and you're right, Steve Mnuchin, former Secretary of Treasury under Donald Trump, is leading a group of other wealthy people to buy TikTok. And they're going to make an offer. And others are circling, other vultures in the capitalist world are circling as well. And if if some mainstream hedge fund people who don't have a political bent, so to speak, get it, that's one thing. If Mnuchin gets it, it become, it'll be right-leaning. It'll become a new truth social, but with videos. And, and that's bad for all of us. It's kind of interesting that they all got so mad members of Congress now, because TikTok had their influencers go on and say, call members of Congress and tell them don't ban TikTok. And people call and they got really upset that people actually listened and began lobbying their elected officials. Like, yeah. how dare you call our office and try to have input? Don't you understand how this is work? It's the charade of input. I was amazed that there were members of Congress who were really upset, literally on air complaining this was outrageous. It was American influencers going on, speaking to other Americans saying, call your member of Congress. And, and they, they blamed China for that. 
when it was Americans doing it. There, I have friends like V from Under the Desk. He, uh, v was yeah. just on last week. V comes on every like two months. You know, there are people like V who make a living, a chunk of their living from this, and they're just sharing news. There's, It's pretty unbiased. I mean, it's left-leaning a little bit, but it's not in any way like way out there. But they're going to be the, the real people like V and others are going to be the victims of this. They're going to lose uh, an income stream unless whoever buys it is very fair. I don't know. And also there's a part of it that the Middle East is playing a, an issue like Jamal Bowman and Congressman and others pointed out. You know, a lot of young people, one out of three, say they get their news from TikTok. Yeah. And there have been people in America who blame TikTok for making young people like Palestinians, which is kind of a weird one. But that's what they do. And I'm like, yeah, but a thousand black pastors sent a letter to Biden demanding a ceasefire. I don't think those middle aged and older black people are on TikTok <laughs> either. I don't think it's just TikTok. I think it's everywhere. People open their eyes. But so it's kind of remarkable. TikTok was said? banned. Uh, sorry, uh, TikTok was banned in India and um, uh, fairly recently. And one of the things that um, they have data in terms of what happened, really, the smaller creators lost their income, mm -hmm. and the smaller creators lost their ability to become stars because it's so much easier to go viral on TikTok than it is on YouTube or Instagram. Um, so that's in terms of, that's evidence in terms of what happens when TikTok is banned. Mm. Um, something to look at. That's interesting because I was reading about that and how some people got around, I guess, through proxies. You can They were yeah, able to get around. Can. It's Well, all right, let's continue on. We're continuing what just happened here with Jessica Brodkin, Liz Winstead, and Brian Wall. All right, so speaking of free speech and X, Elon Musk, who is a scumbag. I mean, I'm from Jersey. This is the kind of, this is what we call the <laughs> guy. And, you know, that's the term of endearment in Jersey in any event. He, Don Lemon, who I like Don. I haven't talked to Don in years, but I used to go on Don's show on CNN. Yeah. When it was on Saturday nights all the time. And then a bunch of times when he moved to the weeknights. And so Don gets canned at CNN. And then he makes a deal with Elon Musk, get his own show, the Don Lemon show. Don Lemon interviews him. And hours after the interview, Elon Musk calls and tells his company the partnership's over. And Elon defended it by saying he was just like CNN's Don Lemon, not the authentic one, whatever that means. It turns out Don Lemon pressed him on things that made him uncomfortable about hate speech on the platform about using ketamine. I guess maybe that made him uncomfortable too. Uh, I'm not sure, but this is what's going on. So Mr. Free Speech canceled Don Lemon. Brian, hypocrisy, what's going on here? Oh, complete. And I, and I watched the clip and it was just such a softball question. It gave Elon so much space to take that question any way he wanted to. And he's so sensitive that he withered right there. You know, I think this is also related to the TikTok thing that we were just talking about. You know, Elon bought Twitter to to basically silence a lot of free speech, even though he claims that it's it's he's a proponent of free speech. I think t uh, Twitter made a lot of people very nervous after the Arab Spring. You know, it, it really affected how people were communicating with one another on an individual basis. And I think TikTok is doing the same thing. That's why Congress is afraid of TikTok. Same way Elon is afraid of Twitter. And so he bought it so he can control it. And he can't even take a softball question from Don Lemon. I mean, it, it is just so amazing as to how fragile Elon Musk is. He is the most sensitive man. He's a oh, poor billionaire, thin skin. Jessica, I know you. we can't speak about CIA stuff, but yeah. if there was someone there you could tell me to speak to to find out if <laughs> Elon Musk legally became a citizen, because I'd like to have him stripped of his citizenship and deported <laughs> back to apartheid world where he wants to live in, because somehow he, he came in, America was his, he was born in South Africa, went to Canada, became a citizen, yeah. and then we were his second choice at best. So what, what do you make of Mr. Free Speech, Elon Musk, and that just like Trump and many on the right who talk about free speech, they never defend speech they really don't like. You you don't see them on. In this case, Elon does this. And I don't hear outpour by the right wingers who love Elon going, that's so unfair. I really, um, you know, I think people just want to, I think uh, he just wants to feel comfortable. I don't know, feel comfortable. Like he doesn't want to be sort of like be in hot water in any way. It's really, um, he makes you know, me uncomfortable just looking at him though. Just looking at him. <laughs> you look just at him, him talking. I'll do. I'm like, what happened? Like, what a weird, weird look, he might have certain things going on. That aside, yeah. I'm not talking about that. Like he's just yeah. an arrogant prick. How did he become wealthy? Uh, I mean, we have the emerald mine, emerald mines. Didn't he have generational wealth from the emerald mines, and then being involved in PayPal? I mean, all of this stuff is like public information about Elon. And um, 
Um, I'm glad you're noting that as opposed to the sources perhaps you got from other places. <laughs> I got this, oh, just let me clear, this is all from open source. <laughs> it's not from me emailing someone with a dot, with a the, the, with dot, a dot, CIA dot org. Right? So, <laughs> that I may, yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm just being very careful, you know, when I'm on, on public media. So, um, yeah. How was uh, Homeland? Was that like when you watched Homeland, were you like bullshit or were you like? <laughs> you know, uh, my favorite, uh, one of my favorite uh, CIA store, it's not even directly CIA, is Archer. I feel like that was the vibe. <laughs> oh, the cartoon? <laughs> the wow. cartoon Archer, just like um, I, I was really the black sheep there. I, it was my first job out of school. So I, I didn't really, re I didn't fit in and I didn't realize it. So, but you went to MIT, so you got recruited in the CIA after. I did get MIT. recruited from MIT, yeah. But it was it was a decision that I made. I was like, I don't know what I was thinking. I wanted to do um, MI, uh, uh, CIA in work in the um, uh, what do you call in in uh, weapons of mass destruction, non proliferation, or do FBI and work against human trafficking. So the wow. human trafficking thing was, um, I thought a little too close to home, um, being like a Russian American. Um, so I was like, I wanted to keep my family safe. That's so interesting, though. Those are like, you're like, oh, I'll say a or FBI. And I went to grad school after college, so I really didn't have any options. Yeah. It was like Home Depot or Sam's Club to get a job in the summer, that kind of <laughs> stuff, to pay the bills. And then yeah. I'm like, I never got, you know, CIA operative or my my fiance, Hen, she's my fiance, ever, yeah. she was on Homeland. She's an actress. And yes. I do a joke about it, but it's true. She didn't play a terrorist. She played the wife of a terrorist yes, yes, in yes. season one. But that's true. I mean, it's a joke, but it's true. It's, it's funny because it's true. That's the truth. So, Liz... What were we talking about? Oh, Elon, what a jackass. How is Twitter, like, do you still use it a, a little bit? Have you found it to be effective anymore in getting the message? Because you had really a robust, you used to be, you were still on it, used to be on it all the time. I would see your stuff in my feed. I never see your stuff. I don't even know if you're posting. And I I mean, I, I stay on, I am on just because I don't, I don't like to see the public square uh, ever, you know, to people that are awful. But like, I, what, you, what was Don Lemon thinking? Like, mm -hmm. it's literally saying, you know what I'm going to do is a real estate deal with Donald Trump. <laughs> I'm sure it's going to go great. Like, you went into a deal with somebody who was profoundly dishonest. And also, the, the platform of Twitter has just become like, I'm just getting, whenever I post, I, I don't get very many views and right. it's just a lot of haters and stuff. And, you know, it's sort of like having being a liberal and having a show on Fox. You know, nobody is going to see your message. All you're going to do is invite people to mm. rain all over your parade every day and call you all kinds of names. And I don't know, I don't know what kind of I don't know what he thought that that Elon Musk had thick skin, that 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 would Don Lemon was gonna actually be able to be Don Lemon. And that people, there was a marketplace for that on Twitter. I like, know that you're right. That's a weird thing. Like, why would you think that's your audience, Don Lemon? Or that somehow you're going to break through. You, nobody, you know, liberals weren't particularly psyched about Don Lemon. <laughs> you know, like he kind of stepped in it a couple of different times and people were kind of like, Don Lemon, what are you exactly? Um, you know, so I don't know. I just think it's an, it's an, uh, like, it's sort of like careful what you wish for, how much sympathy do I have for somebody who went into business with Elon Musk, a black man on a platform that is allows white supremacists? How is that going to go well? Like, you know, when the Proud Boys are invited back and Alex Jones is invited back and and you're like, you know what I'm going to do is be the black guy that makes a difference on a platform right. full of Nazis. <laughs> right. Black man who's openly gay on a platform yes! where, where anti LGBTQ garbage just f crazy stuff out there now that you see stuff. And, and the, the neo-Nazis, the Daily Stormer, and they're literally neo-Nazis. Andrew England, the guy who th fabricated tweets saying I was involved in terrorism and I got death threats and I sued him and I won $4 million, but Nazis are not good at investing. They're just good at hatred. So I, I didn't collect any money. But the point was, it was <laughs> to, to make sure that he couldn't silence marginalized communities. That's why I got lawyers. We sued him. He was banned from TikTok, uh, from uh, Twitter, and Elon Musk let that asshole, a Nazi, Literally, a guy who's proud to be a Nazi. He runs Dare Sturmer, Daily Stormer. He let him back on. I'm like, you're a piece of garbage. That's why it's personal. Elon Musk, to give a platform to literally Nazis 
who hate Muslims, who hate Jews, who would like to see all of us dead and is spewing anti-black stuff, he's garbage. And and you're right. Why would Don Lemon? All right. Well, you got a, a couple of minutes left. I was going to ask about the Oscars, but I really want everyone to get a chance to plug what you're working on because you're all great comics, performers, and activists in your own right. So we'll do this reverse order. Brian, where can people find out your work? I know you're touring. you got a lot of scuff going on. Oh, yeah. You can always find me on all social media platforms at Brian Wool. I'll be in San Diego on Easter Sunday doing stand up over there. And then uh, I'll be at Netflix as a joke this May. So come on out to Los Angeles and hang out with everybody. The comedy, fe- which is great because the Montreal Comedy Festival is dead for at least a year. So the Netflix festival is going to be really elevated. Jessica, what about you, my friend? Um, you can find me on all socials at Jessica Brodkin, B-R-O-D-K-I-N. I'll be at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival doing my one woman show from CIA to Spiritual Healer for the entire month of August. And I'll be running that show in New York City. So just uh, I'll be making be making most of the announcements on Instagram. And um, yeah. From CIA to Spiritual Healer. That's the name of the show. Yeah. I is- might be, it might be Enemy of the State. I don't know. But the working title is CIA to Spiritual Healer. I think it would be cool if you went from spiritual healer to CIA, though. Like, you know, <laughs> you start out helping people. You're like, I've had enough of this. I want to get involved in traffic. No more crystals. Weapons. Give me the guns, you know? That's right. <laughs> and, and my friend, you always have so much going on with your activism and comedy. Where can people go check out your stuff and your podcast, of course? Oh, uh, yeah. My podcast, Feminist Buzzkills, drops every Friday. New episode uh, today. Um, follow Abortion Access Front. Uh and uh, get involved with what we do. It's really fun. We do a lot of stuff. We'll be at the Supreme Court March 26th uh, as they hear the most important uh, abortion case since the overturning of Roe v. Wade. And we're going to we have some incredible uh, uh, direct action stuff that we'll be doing there. And uh, we have a documentary that's in festivals right now about the work of Abortion Access Front called No One Asked You, uh, which is uh, all over the place uh, or uh, touring festivals right now. And if you want to find out more about that, you can go to no one asked you doc.com. That's great stuff. You mentioned the Supreme Court. I'll be at the Supreme Court. I'm like, who books that? Because that's what comedians do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Court, how did you get that? Yeah. Yeah. Could I open? Maybe I should like, five minutes before, you know, just a sort of my or I'm like, hey, can I just give me five? Let me just live jokes here. And Liz Winstead, you know her folks from, well, you, it's all great. Jessica, thanks for being on for the first time. You were great. Brian and Liz is always, always a pleasure to see you. I enjoy your thoughts, insight, and your sense of humor. We're going to take a break and come back with more of this show right after. 